Hello. I wanted to show how to calculate the moment of inertia tensor of this object as well as the principal moments and the principal axes. Now this problem will take advantage, the way that I'm going to do this will take advantage of symmetries, a couple theorems, and also take advantage of a math trick where we decompose the moment of inertia tensor using uh, poly matrices. That sounds kind of crazy, but it's actually very simple to pick up and it's very useful. And it's very, all of the techniques that I'm using here are going to be very useful in not just classical mechanics, but also and especially quantum mechanics. So let's get started. So we want to calculate the moment of inertia of a 2D object here. The 2D object is an isosceles triangle with points at the origin, points on the x-axis, or one point on the x-axis, and one point on the y-axis. We have a 2D object, so our mass density is going to be a surface density. It's going to be equal to just take it to be given to 24 kilograms per meter squared. And because it's 2D, we can use the perpendicular axis theorem. What that tells me is that the perpend is that the moment of inertia of the axis perpendicular to the object is equal to the sum of the two moment of inertias in the plane of the object. So Let's see how that works out. Well, first off, we can take advantage of the fact that we have no mass above and below the xy plane, which means that all terms involving the z component are zero. Whenever we calculate these things, all the moments of inertia involving z will be zero. And also, because of symmetry of the moment of inertia tensor tells us that Ixy is equal to Y or Iyx. So what started off, this was kind of an artificial problem. It started off as calculating nine values, but due to symmetries and due to the use of the perpendicular axis theorem, it went from nine to two. So we've just saved ourselves an awful lot of calculation. So let's see what that looks like. So first off, this is the standard form for IXX. We have a little bit of mass dm. Sorry, my handwriting's messy. Which is y squared plus z squared. But we've already said that z was 0. So guess what? This goes away. And then, without going into specifics of how the integral was set up, this is just a simple thing you could very much easily find in a calculus textbook, but this is how the integral is set up. First of all, but well, I should say, why is, why is it just y here? y is just the distance from the x-axis. This is very important, I should say. So all the little mass bits, Ixx, we're trying to sum up all the locations of the little bits of mass, dm, which are at a distance y away from the x-axis. That's why y shows up. And this is also the reason that due to the symmetry of the object, that we can say that Ixx is equal to Iyy. Because when I look down this axis right here, if I look down the x-axis, I would see the exact same image of the object as if I were to look down the, the y-axis. And that is the reason why Ixx is equal to Iyy. So anyway, that's why the y squared is there. It's a very simple integral to calculate. 
but I've done a few intermediate steps. After you integrate with respect to y, you just have to integrate with respect to x, and we're left with sigma over 12, which when you plug in the numbers, and I should say something about the dimensions here. Sigma was given in kilograms per meter squared. How am I getting kilogram meter squared? Well, what's hidden in the calculation are the dimensions due to this and this, due to the x component and due to dx. What that means is that this has length x cubed, or length cubed in the numerator here, and the dx has dimension of length. So I have dimensions of length cubed times length, which gives me dimensions of length to the fourth power, times sigma, which makes up for that m squared. So anyway, we know that iyy is equal to ixx by symmetry, so, and we've taken advantage of the perpendicular axis theorem, so we've been able to calculate. What was originally 9 is now going to be 2. We had 9 components to calculate, now we just have to calculate 2. So I've rewritten the statement again, but so here's ixy we know is equal to iyx, and here's just the basic definition. We have our bits dm, I should write it, the dm is equal to sigma dx dy. That's where these comes from. So, again, very simple integral, and whenever you plug in for sigma, you'll get, you will get minus 1. So, that seemed rather quick. So, we, now we have our moment of inertia tensor. So, now we need to know what the principal moments are and the principal axes. Well, so here's a trick. First of all, I want to notice that the third column here is completely decoupled from the other three row from the other two rows. So I have zero zero, I have a four here, and a zero and a zero. This third column is completely decoupled from the other two. What that tells me is that this matrix is written in a so-called block diagonal form. And I can take advantage of that. I can take advantage of this and say, well, because this is this is these these two columns, the first column and the second column are not decoupled. We have cross diagonal terms which are going to influence one another. But now, I already immediately see that I can read off one eigenvalue and one eigenvector. The eigenvector is just this third column, or the vector corresponding to this third column, which is just the z vector. And with eigenvalue 4, that is directly this. This is taking advantage of the spectral theorem from linear algebra. So now comes the really neat trick. This, all I have to do is find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this 2 by 2 matrix, which can be written as twice the identity here, right? And then I can subtract the poly x matrix to get this. Now, you're going to be wondering, why on earth am I doing that? Well, this allows me a very easy way to write off the remaining eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The remaining eigenvectors and eigenvalues, specifically, let's start with eigenvalues, will just be written as the value in front the value in front 
of the identity matrix plus or minus the value in front of the poly x. So that gives me 2 plus or minus minus 1, which gives me 1 and 3. And the eigenvectors are just that of the poly x matrix. So borrowing Dirac notation. Now you might be wondering where this third, where does this zero come in? How can the eigenvector of a two by two matrix be three dimensional? And you're right, it can't be. But remember we decomposed the 3D matrix. We rewrote it in a reduced form. So the eigenvectors have to be three dimensional. Technically we are viewing this 2D object from a three-dimensional standpoint, so we have to include it. This might seem artificial, but this is a very useful tool for calculation. And you could obviously calculate these two vectors. Well, if you were to just calculate them of the poly x matrix, you'll just get 1, 1, and 1, minus 1. You can do that the old-fashioned way. That is to say, finding characteristic equations and finding the eigenvalues. But this is taking advantage of something which is pretty common knowledge among physicists. So now we can rewrite the value. We can rewrite the moment of inertia tensor using the spectral theorem of linear algebra, which is just that we can rewrite it in terms of the basis of its eigenvectors, which are just going to be 1, 3, and 4. We've already calculated those. And it was relatively painless to find them. Well, there were some advanced techniques, I think, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually extremely helpful. And I hope, I hope this video was helpful. Thanks.